So we're, we're very happy uh, to welcome Babak Falasafi, who is a professor at EPFL and an ACM and IEEE fellow. Um, I'm sure you, you, or, you all know him or heard of him, but uh, let me still just present him very shortly. So he's a funding director of the EcoCloud Research Center at EPFL and has really a, a truly impressive research output with many uh, important contributions in the space of computer architecture. Uh, I think over the years, his work has also impacted um, several industrial products at prestigious enterprises, such as Sun, IBM, AMD, um, to name only a few. Um, we are we are very happy to have him uh, kick off uh, this uh, 10 year anniversary SPMA and looking forward to his talk. Let me just mention that uh, uh, if, if not Babak, I think that this workshop would not have happened at all uh, <laughs> because he encouraged me to actually carry on and, 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 and continue organizing it even in an online format. So we unmuted you, uh, Babak, go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that uh, our experience with a workshop at Asplos helped also inspired uh, having this on Zoom. Um, I won't take too much time. Thank you for, for, for having this. Uh, let's move on. So um, this, this talk will have uh, both an uh, introduction to where hardware is going and then some examples of uh, interesting solutions that may also have implications on systems. So uh, let's talk about uh, data centers. Again, let me see if I can, okay, there we go. So what are data centers are basically uh, centralized facilities to, to benefit from economies of scale. So the goal of the data center is to try to accommodate as many customers as possible with a given uh, amount of investment. So what you have basically is, a, a, let's say in the future or near future, a million homebrew servers, uh, the network fabric is, is there to, to give you connectivity to uh, as, as broad and generalized uh, traffic patterns in a, in a network as you can get for a multiprocessor. Today's network fabrics actually get you on the wire minimum latency for one server to the farthest center within the same, uh, same data center in the order of microseconds, which is phenomenal for a multiprocessor. And these things are at physical limits. You, you basically find a place where you have electricity, networking, and cooling, and, and then you build them. Those are the three sources. So uh, you'll get, of course, uh, data as the data center, uh, basically your pillars of cloud. And, and about 12 years ago, we're thinking of building larger data centers or for public cloud. But nowadays we also see uh, a proliferation of, of uh, infrastructure closer to the source. That's mostly for faster decision-making uh, and then sort of back-end clouds are mostly there for archival reasons and the longer term analytics. Now, what I guess will, has affected uh, this particular system uh, it, it, it workshop is also the move towards post more. What does that mean? Well, Moore's Law originally was about making things denser. You'll get silicon as twice, twice the density every two years. That gives you about 41% per year annual in density. But then you also uh, you know, improve the efficiency with that. That was known as Denard's law. Most people didn't talk about Denard's law because it came for free with Moore's, uh, Moore's law. On the left-hand side here, the graph, you see that uh, you know, Denard law basically stopped uh, moving about 15 years ago. That's around probably the same time as people started thinking about this workshop because we started going towards multi-core and eventually many-core. On the right hand side, you actually see the density scale. And this graph is from David Brooks, uh, Sigar's blog from 2018. And he shows that density also has slowed down. So uh, it used to be 41% a year. Now in the in recent years, it's closer to 15, 17% uh, a year. Um, and, and this is a fundamental change because that basically means that moving forward, we need to find other ways in which we can get improvements from our platforms. And that most likely will come from uh, a closer integration, uh, uh, probably specialization. So we, we do things more efficiently for the kinds of work that we want to do that are important to us. Uh, and then approximation, which is a lot of what we do uh, is uh, input is analog. The output is also analog because we're, a lot of it is perceived uh, by, by humans, whether it's vision, whether it's, it's speech, 
or whether the output is statistical in nature, nature. So we need to think about going from analog input to analog output, what is the best way to map that to a platform? And in some cases, it may even mean that we should have an analog mapping. But basically the future is in this ISA trilogy, if you will, of integration moving, you know, moving less, moving closer, specialization doing less work and approximation is basically thinking about the input and analog, uh, output being analog and thinking about the map. Now at EPFL, we've had a center where we looked at this. We're mostly looking at finding ways in which you could do things more efficiently about 12 years ago. Uh, since then, we've done a lot of work on post more server design. But again, now as of the uh, past few years, the impact on climate is of interest. Uh, we've, we've looked at integrated cooling, we looked at integrated renewables, uh, and then also holistic op optimization from algorithms down the infrastructure with this uh, group of affiliates that we currently have. Uh, this is sort of uh, also an activity related to what we've been doing, which is uh, now the first carbon emissions label for data centers, which is we're, uh, we're launching that in Switzerland. Uh, and that captures end-to-end -end energy flow for data centers. And if you're more interested in that, we will be more than happy to answer your questions at sdea.ch. Okay, that's sort of the high level view of where this talk is going. So we're gonna talk about post more servers. Uh, I wanna give you a little flashback of, you know, when we started building data centers, the big IT companies like Google they were writing papers about, well, this thing is just about a collection of PCs. And the goal is to try to serve as many customers as possible uh, per second on this collection of PCs. Then I'll talk about what specialization means for logic and memory and give some examples. I won't talk about approximation, that's a topic of another talk, but you've already seen uh, a lot of work on, on AI in that respect in terms of precision. I'll talk a little bit about integrated networks and then I'll, I'll uh, uh, wrap up. So what scale out data centers are mostly are about, you know, you have data, you serve it in memory, memory actually plays the central role. So if you look at vendors like Intel, they're in the business of selling DRAM, they're not in the business of selling CPU. Uh, and and that, that, that DRAM sweet spot, uh, it, it basically uh, dictates what happens in, in the data center and the cloud market. Now, when you buy your DRAM, you, you populate it, there's a sweet spot for you in terms of cost, and then you move on to another plate and you populate that. And this what this is called is basically a scale out architecture where you build everything around this DRAM where you're populating uh, your data. And, uh, and so that's, that's a major impact on, your, on the total cost of ownership. And, and you also think about how to organize both your silicon around that to the extent you can, but also the software stack around it to try to serve that uh, memory as, as efficiently as possible. If you look at today's server blades, as, as Google told us basically 20 years ago, is, is they're basically the desktops of the, uh, of the 80s, right? So what you have is a CPU owning memory, uh, and that memory you get at hardware speed, protected access, and, and then everything else is sort of separated by a legacy interface, and the OS comes in and moves things around for you, whether it's your network storage or now the accelerators. And you also have legacy abstractions for this move. And it's not just legacy interfaces that come with abstractions as well. We haven't really done much there. And what this does is that it fragments your, your silicon because now you have all of your memory with accessible through the CPU and whoever else wants to do anything that's fast that has to be done in memory, they will then integrate their own silicon and logic and they'll also integrate their own uh, memory. And this is for controllers like network controllers, storage controls, but also for discrete accelerators. So here's your 80s desktop. You know, you have a 33 mega 386 uh, accessing DRAM at 250 nanoseconds, running some operating system at the time was Windows, Unix, BSD, and then eventually various flavors of Linux. And it was mostly there for multi-programming this uh, the system so that you then move, the OS would move things around between the disk and also network to the CPU and back. You look at today's blade, it's basically the same thing, except that your CPUs are now two gigahertz, memory is a little faster, not orders of magnitude faster like the CPU is, and you're 
mostly running the same operating system, one could argue, very various flavors, right? So now if you go to a glorified version of your blade, what you get is this fragment in silicon, and the fragmentation appears uh, also in RAM, where you have CPUs and you have DRAM, but then you also have logic, which is fragmented, although that logic is specialized, so we don't consider it as, as a waste. Uh, your NIC now has 32 out of order ARM cores. It can reach its own DRAM. They say, according to Mellanox, up to half a terabyte of DRAM. Your SSD has internal DRAM and inter internal controllers. Uh, your Catapult FPGA has its own DRAM and your GPU has its own DRAM. And uh, this basically leads to a, a bottleneck. So, so the elephant in the room is, is just to summarize it in a big picture is that you have the PC with ESD and you're going to a Facebook uh, blade with Ubuntu, let's say. What you want is actually a completely clean slate approach to this and maybe with with moore's law slowing down post more we'll get there because things will start opening up uh, what you really want is the cpu and the os to be sitting in the back think of them as your control plane they set up uh access to resources they set up connectivity they set up protection domains now everybody all the work is mostly done by the, by the accelerators, right? Those, those guys can, can talk to the hierarchy in a protected way. They can also talk to each other over the network. Uh, and so you no longer have the CPU host and the OS on the critical path of this communication. If you look at Microsoft's catapult, there's a little baby step in this direction, right? So you have, your FPGA, now this is the, the latest version that's public, I believe. Uh, I don't think it's actually the latest version they're, they're running. It's sitting on the network. It has its own custom network stack that sits on the FPGA and the FPGAs can now together uh, collaborate to implement distributed service. But then all the packets that come that are going to the host will bypass the FPGA and go to the host. And the host is there mostly to set up this, this service of FPGAs working together and connecting, uh, collaborating together. So now, um, you know, what, what, how do we go around building this, uh, this memory centric service, right? So uh, we want to make sure the accelerators are, uh, connected uh, together, they're, they're have access to memory, the memory hierarchy one, make sure the network is connected. Um, and uh, the focus around on this, uh, around these memory resources is energy bandwidth, capacity and utilization. The goal is to try to optimize the use of memory as much as possible. Okay. Um, so now let me go to, okay. So we're going to go to specialized logic, specialized memory and integrated network. Now that I've told you a little bit about what the origins of today, today's blades are from. Uh, so specialization funnel is, this is just a sort of, a, a, just a cartoon that says, you know, what we're talking about here, we're not just talking about silicon. So you can think of general purpose paradigms as your, you know, for silicon, your Intel CPU, but we're also talking about software stacks, right? We're talking about the Oracle database being your general purpose uh, data, relational database that can handle all sorts of queries, but not any particular query you know, uh, efficiently. Your Linux operating system is basically a desktop operating system that, that we talked about uh, that we're running on the blades. Your programming language is script at the scripting level, Python, you know, Java, and eventually C. Now, if you go through this uh, funnel, as your applications mature and your algorithms mature, you slowly customize your platform as well. So now you can think of your GPU as a custom silicon platform with its own programming interface for data parallel, data parallel computing. You can think of Cavium Thunder X, which we'll talk about soon, as a general purpose parallel platform for data management. Uh, DB Toaster is a, is a technology that gives you custom query engines, but it will not give you a general purpose query engine. So th those custom query engines 
then would be uh, applicable to a particular domain and it would be a lot more efficient. The X kernel gives you connectivity, user level protected connectivity for, for MCACHE, uh, bypassing Linux. PyTorch is a domain specific language for, for AI. And as you go down this funnel, you, you harden your, your technology. So crypto is, is a hardened technology for security. Uh, network logic is basically there for, for network gear and analog NN is an example of a hardened roadmap. And in the future, what I see happening is that as you go through this tunnel, we need to also somehow uh, find better ways to automate this. So domain specific languages are great opportunities to be able to then create tool chains that will eventually uh, try to automate this transition to the platform. Um, I know there's great work uh, from uh, Martin Odersky, uh, Scala Group, uh, together with Stanford, where Kunle and Lukatun, they've come up with ways in which you can, uh, you can create a bridge between higher level graph languages, graph processing, all the way to back, different backend platforms. And these hardware software interfaces as you harden the platform also change. So today we have instruction sets as the canonical interface between hardware and software for creating, uh, uh, executing operations. But eventually as you harden uh, the platform, there are other ways that would be uh, a lot more fruitful in exposing operations of hardware and, and will move on beyond uh, instruction sets. Uh, we started looking at uh, what server open source software really wanted from, from the server hardware. So we started, you know, looking into this about five, six years ago with a, with a bit of a stronger lens to try to figure out, you know, how well do actually data management uh, services run on, on, these, on these blades that I just presented. And so we put together a suite of benchmarks. Uh, it's now running its, in its third version as of a few years ago. We have uh, Hadoop uh, types of analytics, which is sort of offline analytics, but then we also uh, brought in graph analytics and now uh, in-memory analytics using Spark. Uh, we have web search, which is embedded search, uh, media streaming for video, web serving, and then Memcached, which is a popular software stack for, for hosting uh, data nearby in somebody else's memory and then data survey. We ran this on, uh, on, a, on a Xeon blade at the time, it was a Westmere generation uh, CPUs. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we, we ran a bubble benchmark and we do a comparison between desktop workloads. So spec NT int uh, MCF is, is one of the sort of memory hogs in the spec int. Spec is, uh, fairly high profile CPU benchmark. And then we compared it to, to these workloads, the scale up workloads, which mostly populate their, uh, the memory with data and just serve that memory or, or uh, implement an op, uh, a service on top of that memory, if you will. We ran a bubble benchmark on the Westmere. Westmere had six cores uh, and about 12 megabytes of on-chip uh, cache. Uh, we, the first few megabytes host the uh, code. So we started running the bubble after the first few megabytes. And you see that as you uh, size that bubble, you give it more cache. In fact, it benefits the, the desktop CPU benchmark really well. But the minute you run uh, the, the server workloads, they don't actually benefit much from that extra cache. And the reason is that, uh, these workloads have populated the off-chip memory. That memory is fairly uh, sort of uh, occupied. I mean, you're, you're actually using most of the capacity of that memory. And when you do that, you have about three to four orders of magnitude disparity between the capacity of data off-chip and whatever your LLC is on-chip. Here, if we're looking at 64 gigabytes, here on-chip, we're looking at about 12 megabytes. And that capacity basically stops you from being able to benefit from any reuse in the cache beyond your code. And in fact, if you make that cache smaller, in this case, in the bubble benchmark, we don't see that. But if you actually gave this code smaller caches uh, that are faster, 
then this line, which is going up a little bit, this red line would actually be immediately at one, which means that you get absolutely nothing from that cache beyond a few megabytes. And you can see on the right-hand side here is that unlike the desktop workloads, the uh, instruction on-chip instruction capacity of, of the, these workloads is also fundamentally different. You see a lot of misses coming in the L1, and then the Intel also had this L2 at the time, which was only 256 kilobytes. So if you have a couple of megabytes worth of instruction working set, you're just missing in all these L1, L2 caches. So here is a sort of animation of what you have, right? You have these big cores with a lot of cache. The code is mostly getting supplied by the, by the on-chip cache, which is over-provisioned. Uh, most of this silicon is not useful. And in fact, if you made it smaller, you would go faster. So your code would be faster. Now, if you go to this redesign, if you will, a, a different organization for the same amount of silicon, the same power, if you go to these three-way out-of-order arms, they don't have to be arms. It could be any ISA, right? As long as you can do that within that power budget. Uh, then you get a lot more logic back. You get now you have 85% of your logic. Also, because your cache is much, much small, smaller, you're going from a two level L2 LLC in the Westmere to a single level of LLC and, and just L1s in the course. And you get a faster instruction supply as well. So you get seven times more thread level parallelism plus a faster instruction supply. So Cavium, which is a company that was recently uh, acquired by Marvell. Uh, they based their first uh, Thunder X processor based on what we proposed. And in fact, they sized it exactly the same way and they optimized the instruction supply. And they showed that if you run these workloads, you get about 10x improvement over Xeon. 7x comes from the thread level parallelism and another 3x comes from the instruction supply. And of course, beyond that, you can continue uh, optimizing your logic for data management. So here in this example, Walkers, uh, we looked at a clean slate approach of if you want to implement a joint operator uh, in, soft, in minimal software, minimal hardware, uh, what, uh, what would it take? And so what we did was we, uh, we deconstructed the entire joint operator into a few operations at the algorithmic level, which would then be mapped into a subset of C which would, would then compile to a custom design instruction set that would only implement those operations. And these operations were there to implement control flow, do address generation, and allow any data structural traversals uh, through uh, the cache hierarchy. Uh, so we could support a programmable notion of multiple data structures, right? Hash table versus B tree. We parallelize those pointer chains with minimal hardware. So we decouple the hash of finding the address and the key inside the data structure with the walk that would then go down a pointer chain to eventually get it. Those pointer chains themselves were decoupled into queues so that each pointer access would, would be independently done on its own. So you can free up all the dependence and parallelism. And we showed that if you do this and you plug it into uh, whatever amount of bandwidth you have at your L1 cache level, you get about 15X better performance per walk over Xeon for this operation. By the way, Oracle also built a prototype called Rapid around the same time. And when they published a paper on Rapid, uh, they showed that for SQL analytics with custom design cores that did message passing, they get roughly about 15x better performance per watt over Xeon. We then use these uh, sort of insights from exactly what was happening in our custom walker uh, accelerator to figure out how we can improve existing database stacks without any changes to the hardware. And in fact, it turns out that that decoupling of the hash and the walks themselves was the most important uh, effect that we're getting in terms of unraveling the parallelism. So if we could somehow implement this schedule each pointer access through a really thin layer of software, which we're implementing at the assembly level, but eventually we could then move on to coroutines because coroutines became a standard uh, of, of a C distribution. Then we could now do this pointer chasing uh, with a joint operator 
with on Xeon without any hardware support. We, we break up all the dependencies in the microarchitecture, we get a factor of two improvement in, uh, in uh, data structure traversals. And this is now, ever since then, has been integrated into SAP HANA uh, and was published in another uh, paper, DLDD. As we move towards more specialized uh, systems, we can also benefit from a closer integration of memory. So we, people have been talking about die stack memory. AMD actually invested a lot in die stacking memory. Uh, that was a few layers of DRAM that would then be stacked on top of a layer of logic. Turns out that this is in theory doable, but in practice, this is, quite hard because there are the different companies that fabricate silicon for memory and those that fabricate silicon for logic and they have completely different tool chains and into these tool chains are really difficult to uh, come together because uh, typically logic guys have uh, non-uniform heat density and you can have hot spots around logic guys because of irregularity of the patterns on the logic, whereas DRAM is highly uniform and that completely messes up the thermals. And, and, and then it also messes up the integration of the two. Now what's happening is this uh, sort of two and a half D stack, which is instead of bringing everything together and sandwiching it, we take a layer of silicon, which is passive, doesn't have any transistors in it. And now we host two uh, different die stacks on it. We have a, we have a, uh, a, a logic die, and then we have a stack of DRAM die that are homogeneous that, that don't have all the thermal issues that we, we have. And, and this also opens up a lot of opportunities for co-design. Uh, now, uh, why is that? Uh, well, turns out that uh, we spent a lot of electricity and also efficiency moving data around. And there was a lot of algorithms where you do very little with arithmetic, but you go through a lot of data. And if you're doing little arithmetic over a lot of data, then what, what you end up with is that, that arithmetic you're doing on the CPU die is only a fraction of a picojoule. But you spend about three orders of magnitude, four orders of magnitude more picojoules just moving that data around. Now, instead, if you could uh, take advantage of this memory bandwidth that you have internally, uh, connectivity that you have internally, and find a way to implement your operations closer to that bandwidth, then you not only benefit from the parallelism you get from the bandwidth, but you also benefit from uh, that uh, lower movement. Now here you can see, for example, that uh, instead of having a limited bottleneck in terms of this memory channel connecting your, your CPU to DRAM, 24 gigabytes per second, and at longer orders of magnitude, uh, energy dissipated in moving data, if you could somehow uh, bring your logic closer, uh, you could benefit from re spending less, I apologize for that, spending less uh, energy moving, but also benefit from about an order of magnitude more bandwidth that's, that allows you to then go through your data. So I wrote a little, um, position paper about near memory processing a few years ago where I said, look, basically DRAM internally is a block device, right? So in the OS community, we're used to block devices. You move things in big chunks, you try to overlap that latency, and you try to take advantage of whatever you've moved. Uh, if you look at DRAM internally, and I'll get over that, uh, explain that to you in the next slide, it's a much better medium for streaming than random access if you're doing things closer to memory. And that also favors parallelism over arithmetic. So instead of building things that go super fast and, benefit and, and can cater irregular computation, you go fully parallel, orders of magnitude more parallel, but now you'll slow things down. You don't, have, you don't need fast arithmetic, you just need wide arithmetic. Ideally, whatever you're doing with that RAM, should still smell, act, and feel like uh, whatever CPU wants to see because you're gonna use that RAM for CPU at the same time, you're also gonna do your near memory processing in it, right? That way you don't waste uh, silicon. 
So why is DRAM a block device? So it turns out that when you activate a row of memory, that row is like kilobytes, right? It could be a kilobyte, it could be you know, up to, with, with SCM now we're getting to 16 kilobytes of row, right? When you activate that, most of your energy and most of your latency goes into activating that row. So your best bet is to finding a, a computation that can then use all of that uh, row together. And uh, if you, for example, take DRAM at 128 gigabyte per second and you only do random access, let's say you get a cache block, you're now using a fraction of that, right? And, and it also uses a lot more power because you keep going back. You're, you're basically wasting whatever you just fetch. If you get a kilobyte and you only use 128 bytes of it, you're throwing everything else away in terms of power as well. So we had a proposal for, uh, well, what if we had this near memory logic? And this can be implemented also on HBM. At the time, we're doing this on HMC, which was a proposal for Micron for actual die stacking. Uh, but uh, nowadays, HPM looks like is a, is a technology that, that is going to uh, gain a lot more wider traction and multiple companies are supporting it. So you now take the uh, budget for, for whatever uh, area and, and, and power you have, and you go to these super wide uh, stock SIMD units. These are SIMD units you can get uh, today. Uh, at the time we, we did this, you, could, you had a thousand bits in the units from ARM at, at the, that, could, that we could support at one gigahertz using this area. And if you now build this sort of tiled uh, version of, of these SIMD units with no caches, no memory hierarchy, right? Just going through DRAM directly and you stream your data out of DRAM, uh, you could run the basic operators for Spark Analytics at around two orders of magnitude more efficiency over Xeon. Uh, now, one would wonder then how do you actually do streaming? And it turns out that there are a lot of algorithms for block oriented devices. In the old days, databases were on disk. Uh, so we didn't necessarily do hash join. We, we did sort join, uh, which is uh, higher order complexity. But in fact, it gives you this beautiful streaming behavior, right? So you, in, in this case, you're doing more work but then you're actually more efficient. If the gains you get from efficiency, both latency and power are better than what you lose from doing redundant work or extra complexity, then it's a win situation for you. And uh, this, uh, today, well, in the 70s, 80s, we did you know, in-disk databases, then memory became uh, sort of, uh, databases became in memory. But in recent years, we've also seen graph processing systems. Uh, for example, Xtreme is a good example of uh, a block-oriented uh, algorithm for graph processing that, that benefits exactly in the same way. And if you, if you go do an edge-centric streaming, then you get your benefit from, from that sequential uh, behavior of, of the block device. And, and, and Xtreme has also shown that when you're going to disk or flash, you, you benefit from from doing edge centric kind of graph processing. So, so this, the, the key here is, this is really algorithm platform co-design. It's not just changing the platform, which is something uh, that, that again, is gonna be a recurring theme in the, in the work to come. So here's a lock scale speed up over uh, multi-core CPU and the, so we, we also compare it against uh, a, uh, just a multi-core without the, the SIMD units, but, but a multi-core that benefits from, from this change in the algorithm as well. So we're doing now uh, sort join and, and streaming algorithms instead of the hash join algorithm. And this is a multi-core that doesn't have, I mean, it just has the regular cache hierarchy, right? Whatever you can fit. And then you compare it against one that's custom designed for SIMD and streaming. And, and you see that the algorithmic change itself gives you 10x. And if you also use wider SIMD units, depending on how much bandwidth you have, if you have more bandwidth, obviously you can go to wider units, you could easily get uh, up to 50x. 
Now, moving beyond that is, is memory hierarchies. Memory hierarchies are also becoming heterogeneous. There's a, uh, you know, there's, this is what we're used to is SRAM main memory SSD, but now we're getting this higher bandwidth memory that's coming closer to the socket. And then we're getting the storage class memory that's going between us and the flash. The most important thing here is that you, you know, you have the canonical cache miss rate capacity curve, right? And, and the thing to think about is that uh, as long as you can get most of this hot area of the curve where you capture most of the miss rate up to the knee in a higher bandwidth, perhaps more expensive layer, then the rest of it can be handled with conventional technologies as technologies sort of emerge, right? So here is what a, a really rough breakdown of where information is, right? You're on ship with SRAM, which is fairly uh, expensive, you know, six transistors per cell, you, you cover megabytes, right? Then you go to this uh, emerging HBM kind of memory, which is lower capacity, but higher bandwidth and more expensive. You cover your 32 gigabytes of data, and then you could go back to a DDR off package memory. And eventually that off package memory can be SCM. It could be, uh, it could be even flash if you're watching the Astri flash talk today. Um, well, broken legacy abstractions, one of them is your TLB reach, right? It, it, today we have uh, no server nodes that uh, even at EPFL that reach two terabytes of, of DRAM, but, but you just don't have the TLB reach for that. Why? Because we're using these legacy abstractions for translation from, from the 70s and 80s. And uh, here, if you, you can see this graph, uh, if you use 4K pages, eventually, you know, you you basically level at very high miss rate. You can never dip. If you go to larger, huge pages, you still need tens of thousands of entries just to cover 32 gigabyte. That's the first layer of your expensive cache, if you will, right? Um, if you, now page walks is sort of the counter sort of part of that, which is, and that these are actual numbers from the ASCII lib benchmarks, which are just tiny little micro benchmarks to traverse data structures. And this is on a real Intel platform, which already has a few kilo entries of, of TLB per core. That's kilo entries of TLB per core. That's like tens or 20 kilobytes of SRAM, right? And you see that around eight meg or beyond, you're just like, you start doing page one. So this, this doesn't, this is completely broken, right? And it's something we need to work on. Uh, well, uh, there is segmentation. People have proposed segmentation where accelerators, this leads to fragmentation, right? This is not a new thing. We've had segments before. Uh, there's partition NUMA. Oracle has been partitioning their data for quite some time. It's, it's also not new. Uh, we now have released support in Linux uh, for, uh, for page walks. So Linux inherently has support for data placement in NUMA. But we now have also added support for, uh, we have a paper that provides uh, NUMA page walks. This is an incremental improvement. It doesn't really get you where you want to be. Uh, we need a TV scale translation solution for SCM and then eventually beyond. And if you are interested in bringing Flash on board, uh, then Flash as well. I'm gonna move on and just talk a few slides about integrating networks, right? Why are networks interesting? Well, networks are interesting because network fabrics are actually improving, projected improvements are faster than logic density. So if you get LNOX test 20% a year for the next uh, 10 years, we're getting 15% logic density per year uh, from, from Moore's law. So, so that's, that's quite exciting. And then we're also, <laughs> this is the other trend, which is in a collision course, on a collision course with, with network fabrics and logic, which is that we're making our services, we're going to microservices, so we're doing less work and we want serverless, which means we wanna be able to launch uh, computation and perhaps even do, you know, parallelize that computation as much as possible. Uh, there is overhead in RPC, there is overhead in orchestration. Facebook had a paper at Askloss that talked about this. Uh, we need new abstractions. We need, we need to also think about co-design for network stacks. Uh, the Catapult network stack that runs on the FPGAs, that's an example of a specialized network stack for, the, for Brainwave. Um, 
Well, uh, memory is the most precious silicon, right? We, as, as long as we agree with that, then we need to look at ways in which we can pool that memory. Uh, there are solutions for pooling uh, memory into a shared and user level protected uh, memory that can then be accessed with a lightweight fabric. I'll talk about that. Uh, there's also proposals for shared swap space and infinity swap and a number of different variations of that. Uh, you can think of this load balancing shared object story as a, as a, as a RAM cloud with hardware support, if you want. Okay. Uh, we want to find clever ways of offloading uh, the pooling logic uh, to be able to reduce the overhead uh, by, by bringing things closer and perhaps offloading some of that into the hardware. And then we want to minimize fragmentation. Today, we sell containers, right? Uh, you sell an eight gigabyte container, you're paying a huge price premium for that. Most of that eight gigabytes is not gonna be used. So if you can find a clever way of maybe then as a provider, provide two gigabytes and then support the rest of that over the network with an with a accelerated uh, swap path, then you get a huge return on your investment. And, and, and that's, today we're basically, at, for the containers where we're causing a lot of fragmentation. We did some work on accelerating RDMA-like fabrics. This is scale out NUMA. Uh, we could do user level protected uh, cache blocks, but we also could do bulk objects that were, that were unrolled. So, so that network interface basically had the responsibility of, of, of uh, doing this uh, stateless uh, protected uh, transfers of, of pages of data from a remote node. And we could do that with a small factor of, of local memory. At least we actually synthesized some of this logic and uh, it was also licensed. We could then provide uh, extensions for messaging and RPC over that. And this is Daglas's uh, thesis at EPFL. Uh, we ex we've extended that uh, at last year's ASPLOS. We uh, then Further looked at once you have a network interface integrated, then you can do load balancing on the RPC request and then give the, basically the a, a implementation of a single queue instead of having uh, to partition your requests among multiple queues because you're doing this as software, you have no hardware support for it. Uh, this year at ISCA, we also have support for hardware termination in the LLC. So we can also uh, improve any interference you get from uh, DRAM bandwidth uh, from the NIC instead of spilling, we actually terminated in the LLC. Uh, and then a bit on data transformation. This is what we presented at ASPLOS this year. Uh, data transformation is part of orchestration and it's a bottleneck. Uh, if you want to do transformation with Trift or Protobuf, uh, Protobuf, I believe Google says accounts for 10% of all their CPU cycles. Uh, Thrift, we measured that you could do at best to two and a half gigabits per second on a CPU. On data transformation, data transformation is basically uh, microservices storing their objects in a different format and you have to trans, uh, translate this format. Uh, and this is all done serially by, by mapping it to software and eventually instructions, a binary. And mm -hmm. once you map it to the software, then you lose all the parallelism. So, uh, if you can find a way to uh, trans uh, transform this mapping information and ex unravel all the parallelism in the hardware, then you can build a pipeline that will implement it at line rate. And that's exactly what we did. It's called Optimus Prime. Optimus Prime sits next to your NIC. You can have multiple NICs depending on how big your socket is. Uh, the interface to this pipeline is not an instruction set. The interface is a schema. It's a collection of address type pairs. And this address type pairs then are decoded at the front end of the pipeline. They're, they're exposed into parallel operations into the middle of the pipeline. And uh, well, what you can get is then this uh, sort of uh, line rate, near, near line rate uh, performance, whether you're doing serialization or whether you're doing deserialization with a single Optimus Prime pipeline. So on that note, um, I believe I, sl I, I uh, started a few minutes later than was uh, in the program, but I hope that I, it wasn't too fast for you. Uh, the trends are that they, the demand is continuing, perhaps even faster than more. Uh, 
This is conventional Moore, which is 41% a year. Uh, Moore's law is slowing down, and memory is, is the center of the game when it comes to servers. So we need to revisit our, our abstractions uh, and then think of integration and, and uh, think of uh, specialization and eventually approximation. Uh, we do this for CPUs, we do this for accelerators, network storage, and the entire system. On that note, thank you very much. Thank you, Babak. So I, I'm just going to clap for you. Uh, since uh, unfortunately this is the, the drawback of having this format is that we can have, you cannot actually hear people clapping at home. So let's uh, let's go and try a round of questions. Um, if uh, you know if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll uh, I'll unmute uh, the person. Who, uh, yes. So Dushyan, do you do you want to go ahead? Uh, uh, no, I was clapping. I thought that's what I was doing. Ah, but thank okay. you. For <laughs> In the chat, it was uh, it, it looked like you're raising your hand. Okay. So while I'm while I'm checking here, I have a question actually, Babak, for you. Uh, so you mentioned a little bit, you alluded to the to the challenge of uh, you know the in-memory accelerator is making sense of the the memory that the application has. So can you can you elaborate a little bit more on what you know would you expect for applications to change in in terms of virtual memory, you know, how the data structures that we use uh, commonly in software are well suited or ill suited for for this kind of uh, parallel hardware accelerators close to the memory. Yeah, so in memory, so there are two aspects of in memory, right? And, 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 and then you also mentioned virtual memory. In memory, we really need to think, I, I think that if we're going to do uh, near memory, some of this near memory technologies that are emerging, we need to really think about memory as a block device. So that's a fundamental change for software, right? Because historically, we think of memory as random access. And then there is a whole bunch of other issues that are related to that, which is, uh, you know, address translation, uh, coherence, all those things should be there so that that memory that you have near you still looks like memory to the CPU in case the CPU wants to also use it. Right. And then there is this virtual memory thing, which you mentioned. Uh, I think virtual memory in general, whether you do in memory or whether you're just, um, if you're, doing anything beyond tens of gigabytes. Uh, address translation is, is just not gonna be able, we can't do address translation we've been doing trans, uh, until now, right? If you think about 32 gigabytes with huge pages, and that's tens of thousands of entries for an Intel core, the minute you go to accelerators or anything that's smaller, that tens of thousands of entries is roughly the size of a core. Right. So you can't, you just can't even support 32 gigabytes of, of memory. So we really need to completely redo address translation. Uh, there are a lot of people who are looking at this. There, there are a lot of interesting ideas there. We also have some ideas at ETFO, which we haven't published yet, uh, which is rethinking the entire uh, paging abstractions. So thank you. And uh, I think in the interest of time, uh, we'll, we'll go on with the schedule if that's, uh, that's okay. I think. Will you be maybe checking the, the Slack once in a while? The yeah, I'll be Slack on or... Slack. Uh, I'll be on Slack. Please, if you have any questions, I invite everybody to, to uh, would love to engage you on these kinds of topics. So 